project about the, uh, 2015 and what inspired me to start this Instagram was because um, I was living in New York and I was, um, I felt like, so I guess like a little bit of my history, I grew up in LA, in Boyle Heights in East LA, and in, in 1996, I lost a cousin to gang violence. And um, so then I moved to the East Coast and I, I started thinking about my upbringings, about, you know, I guess, you know, like my experience growing up in LA and about my cousin's death. And I was able to get a hold of his death certificate. And when that happened, I felt like, I just, I guess, appreciated how important physical documents and material is because to me, it just felt like it humanized my experience and my stories. Like I had proof that something happened. My, you know, just like my childhood and how I grew up in LA, but I couldn't really, describe it in a way that he would understand because he was from the East Coast and um, I just didn't want to describe like, you know, like lore writers and gangs. It was just like, how do you describe someone that, that was raised in the midst of that but not necessarily part of a gang? So starting this project also, I felt like I had to create a new language for just to talk about like, growing up in LA. So then um, he talked to me about the Instagram. You know, he's like, maybe you should just start a, a, an Instagram account. And for a long time, I was like, fuck no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, like, I guess like a week passed and I thought like, maybe it is a good idea. And because I also, um, I had like maybe three photos with me and these magazines that you'll look at. And I felt like that was the closest that I could, I guess I could, could describe my childhood or my teenage years in LA. And um, so then I went for it and I started an account and I started posting, I posted three photos and some images from the Street Magazine. And I mean, it just took about like a couple of weeks and I already, you know, like in a month I had 18,000 followers. And then LA Weekly hit me up. I did an interview with them and just kept growing. And that to me felt like, like as a group of, uh, I guess like a community or uh, collectively, a lot of us were um, finally having a conversation about growing up in LA or like filling this void that had to be filled. So that's how I started. Um, and now I have about like 96,000 followers. I've been doing this for two years. Uh, now it's becoming a physical archive rather than digital. People have been donating material. All this stuff here that, that you'll see are they're like flyers, um, magazines that have been donated to the archive. So, yeah. Um, I think it's really important to talk about you know what the images contain and maybe their you know social historical context. A lot of these are like late eighties from throughout the nineties, right? Yeah, well, I start uh, from. I guess I'm mostly interested in, in in photos before you could like take selfies. Mm -hmm. So pre pre internet or pre social media. Right, right. Um, so. I know a lot of the images are from what uh, is called party cues, right? Party cue day, and like party and enthusiasm and all these things. Maybe you could talk about that culture and what it was like, and talk about maybe the, you know, a lot of the backyard parties that are also documented, and why that was happening. A lot of people were skipping school, you know. Um, I, I, I think also we need to put this in like a larger. Historical content as far as concerning like Latino kids or brown kids, like what the media was saying about them and like what it was contrast that with what was actually happening. Yeah, that was another reason. I mean, it just like it just kept unfolding, and there were always there was always something that pushed me to continue. You know, like first it was my dad, my cousin's death was okay. and then um, watching these Fox News videos that mm -hmm. were put out in the 90s about, um, I guess Fox News went to our parties at one point and 
do this whole thing, like a coverage on, on like what like uh, the youth is that they were doing back in the day, and then pretty much portrayed us as like we were like out there like not going to school, being lazy, getting drunk, uh, ditching school. So at the time when that came out, it felt really. I mean, I was really excited about it. You know, like we were getting some sort of like recognition. You know, so um, and then after. Like, I guess through my research and understanding this history, I realized that it was really fucked up what they were doing, wasn't it? You know, mm -hmm. like the way, it was just like this like repetitiveness um, of like the way we were being portrayed. So now the way I see this archive is that like we, you know, I guess like the people who submit the photos are representing themselves the way they want to be represented without like relying on outsiders. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, I wanna I wanna get back to authorship like in a minute, but um, I think there's something to say, you know, about uh, um, I know we talked about this about you know school not being a place a safe place for a lot of a lot of brown kids, you know, um, going to school and not seeing your history taught to you, you know, you know back then of course like ethnic studies like that was just starting um, and you know a lot of people didn't believe exactly that you know school was for them like they didn't see themselves their history being taught to them or you know being treated like criminals uh, this continues through media characterization of Latino kids right like constant criminalization and I feel like this archive definitely like provides a complex view of of what was happening, you know, these parties are like super intricate, you know, like there's a lot of organizing going on. You know, you talk about like the map points Instagram as well mm -hmm. and talk about how the parties were organized. People had to go to have a meetup place, right? And then have call in and find the address of the party. Like you all had to get together and somehow like make yeah. it happen. Uh, well, yeah, this is all uh, DIY analog. Um, we were using, we were, I mean, we had someone who designed the flyers for us. You know, these are all like 14, 15 year old kids geeking out on, on graphics. Um, and then we didn't put the address on the flyers, we used map points. And what that was, was uh, it was a meeting point, let's, let's say a gas station somewhere, or like a corner, like a ma two main streets. And what we did was, there was someone there, uh, you'll give them like three bucks, because that's how much you know we would pay for the party. And then they'll give you the address to the party, mm -hmm. and that's how you got to the party. You know? But um, we also had voicemails or party lines. Uh, you, we put all the info there, and then maybe like an hour before the party. He, he says this, he says, quote, I was a substitute teacher in the early 90s at, a, at the high school up here on the east, in the east side, Maras tells me. The schools were to totally corrupt, ready to crumble. I was in a classroom in Holland Beck. They hadn't had a regular teacher in months. They had, they had different types, different uh, substitutes every day, and I was like, what the fuck? Have you guys learned anything? And there were a lot of people that didn't even show up. Then I asked, where are they now? Where are they? And a lot of the times the answer was a ditch party. So 